Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Okay. So now when we talk about the, we're going to talk about the Four Noble Truths tonight. And I like to do this because the Four Noble Truths actually, I wish I had my little pencil, but I'm not sure where it is. I'll tell you what, you look over there and see if there's a box with a little pencil in it. Um, but I'm not sure if it's on the table somewhere. It's in a little box. No, it's in a little box that's shaped like this. It's a white box, it's shaped like this and it's near the back of the desk, I think. Back of the desk, near the red thing, where the books are, over in that corner. No, it's not there. I don't know, we don't know what happened to it. That's okay. So I can't draw you pictures, gee. <laughs> it's the end of the world, no. Mm -mm -mm. So, but I can, you can write this down as we go along. So first of all, the most important thing about understanding the Four Noble Truths uh, is... The uh, pad, the pad is uh, at the uh, right hand side, right hand side, uh, back of your uh, uh, computer. I know, but it's box. under a tremendous amount of stuff and I don't oh. know how to use it. And oh. it would be pretty arduous for me to try to oh. do it now because oh. I don't know how to use it yet. Okay, no problem. So, the thing to remember about the Four Noble Truths is today in some of the writings that we um, we find, we're living in a time that is about 2,600 years after the Buddha was here. And it was obvious that eventually this was going to happen. And there, because of things that happen in different cultures and amongst beings, things get changed and the, no one would think that the Four Noble Truths would get changed, but they did get changed. So let's look at, first of all, what's going on right now with the Four Noble Truths so that you understand that the traditional translation is very important to keep intact because um, in English, and I can only explain this to you in, in through English, but you have the Four Noble Truths and the first one is, uh, there is suffering. The second one is there is a cause of suffering. The third one is there is a cessation of suffering. And the fourth one is there is a path to the cessation of suffering. So we write those down like that. Now we need to understand what kind of statements those are, because this is very important that they don't ever get changed. There is suffering is a state of fact, is a stated fact. But when you say there is suffering, it's like an invitation. It's an open-ended statement. That's why Siddhartha decides to go and find out what exactly is the suffering. That's what he, he spends a lot of time in the Majjhima Nikaya in many of the suttas. And <clears throat> he's actually, if you want to see the clearest uh, explanation about this, you can go to uh, 141, Majjhima Nikaya number 141. And when you go there, the exposition of the truths, that one will tell you in very precisely what each one of the truths is. And it tries to give you a little paragraph about each piece. It also gives you preciseness about what is meant by sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. So those five pieces are also there and you get a clear picture about what this was. But the main point to remember is that statement, there is suffering period is an open-ended statement of fact, you know, but it's invitational, okay? And what it means is there is suffering in life. Okay, that's what you need to remember. Now, the second one is there is a cause of suffering. And he wanted to, again, it's a statement that's true, but it's an open-ended statement. It is an invitation 
um, for the person to investigate to see if they can identify exactly what the cause of the suffering is. The third one is there is a cessation of suffering, same case. It is an open-ended statement. And you and I know in our lives that we're not suffering all the time. And so that there are cases, times where a cessation of suffering will arise and it'll be there if it's pleasant and then it passes away due to anicca, which is impermanence and the constant movement of everything. <laughs> and so it's always changing. Now the path, there is a path to the cessation of suffering. That's also a statement, but he develops that later. He starts with the first three pieces. So when I say that it's been changed lately, we're not sure where it started, but 11 or 12 years ago, this wasn't here. And all of a sudden it is here. And here's how it has been changed. Below the first one where you say there is suffering, it simply means there is suffering in life. And no one is going to contest that, okay? But the new statement says life is suffering. Now, if, if you have to put yourself in Siddhartha's position, uh, the Bodhisattva looks at life and he's told by somebody, life is suffering. What would he have gone to figure out anything? In my opinion, he wouldn't have bothered because that's a fact and it's a closed statement. I want you to try to see the difference in English, how this is working. And the second one is uh, they changed, uh, there is a cause, um, there is a cause of suffering that changed that one. And they said a statement, the cause of suffering is desire. Well, this is a funny one. It's true, but it's not correct. And what do I mean by that? I mean that <clears throat> the word, for instance, in Pali, chanda is a neutral word. And it's a word where it could be about wholesome desire for the lay person to have a good marriage, a good relationship, a good job, succeed at work, get high grades at school. All these things are perfectly legitimate, healthy desires for a person to have. Or it could mean an unwholesome set of desires, you see? So saying that desire is the cause of absolutely everything would be a devastating statement to say to someone, unless you kept talking. <laughs> this is what I said, unless you kept talking. After you say the cause of suffering is desire, you have to keep talking. You have to keep explaining. So if somebody says that, without continuing to talk and explain anything, that's a no-no, that's not real, it's not real. All right, the third one is, um, we said that the, the, the general open-ended statement was there is such a thing, there is a cessation of, of suffering. And that means there is a situation where you experience the cessation of suffering sometimes, and Again, it's open-ended for you to investigate that. But if I change that and I say the cause of, um, let's see, the only, I know what it was, the only way for the cessation of suffering is to desire absolutely nothing. Now, again, this is a little bit of a trap because we don't, know how it started or who started it when who said it but it's it's kind of irrelevant but it's a little bit of a trap here because if you if you say that um in a way you know the end result the end training and the point where a person experiences nibbana they have no desire this way, no desire that way they float right in the middle and they're guided by the wholesome support system, you see, but the average person, the average person in life, you know, who is looking at the, for the cessation of suffering, 
the escape from suffering. He found the escape from suffering, the solution to the suffering. He found the way out of it in daily life, as well as a final super mundane Nibbana. So this is what we we have to know more about the teaching to understand that there is not just one Nibbana. And when I came into Buddhism originally, I thought, oh, there's one Nibbana. Hmm. That couldn't be that complicated, right? <laughs> but that's not the case. You know, there is the potential for four attainments and four fruitions. That's eight attainments. That's eight, okay? And there's a super mundane Nibbana, which is the all-time final Olympic Nibbana that takes you off the charts and no possibility of coming back again, completely off the wheel of Sansara. So there was a graduated system involved in this, you see? So anyway, this gets twisted by that. So I just want you to be aware of this when you are going out and looking at books and things people have written about Buddhism today. You have to be very, very careful of this. You don't teach somebody who has never gotten on a bike you don't give them a 28 speed bike and say, now let me teach you how to ride a bike. We'd give you a graduated system of training for tennis, for sailing, for riding bikes, for even riding dirt bikes and riding motorcycles and racing cars. Everything has a graduated system of training. So I wouldn't throw you into a situation where you would have to give up everything in life and never smile again and not desire absolutely anything. It's ridiculous. It's absolutely absurd to, to present this to somebody who's just coming in to what um, Buddhism is about. And anyway, that not desiring anything is a little bit different than having an equanimity, an, an equanimity that is totally exceptional and nothing disturbs you. No matter what happens, you're able to just look at it and say, this is happening. This is the present time between here and here. And here's where we are. And we only have to look at this. Now let's see, what is the suffering right here? What is the cause? And what it would be the cessation of it? And what shall we do to solve it? And so we can use the, 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 uh, the truths in this way by for solutions like that so anyway this is the bar i always want people to have this deaf breakdown of what's going on with what i call slippage and i don't call it uh, perverted definitions or other terminology i just say this is slippage and this kind of slippage in the way that we write a sentence and say talk about the four noble truths is not something you know that was viciously done it probably was done by somebody who had english as a second language and they thought that this meant the same thing these sentences meant the same thing but these sentences don't make the same they don't mean the same thing and so we have to be very careful to go back to the original translation that was correct of just there is suffering there is cause there is a a cessation. And the last part is to look at the value of the path that is supporting you to uh, reach that, to discover it and reach it. So that's part one. Okay. Now, the second thing we look at is what, what were these? Let's look at what these actually were. So most people who look at Buddhism, they think that the Four Noble Truths are the outline of Buddhism and the outline of what the Buddha taught. And, in, and that's acceptable to say it's the summary, the summary of what was happening and what he taught. That's okay. I mean, you can say that's, uh, that's what's happening here. So that's one way that we use them in the way that we described it. Now, the second way that we use it, we look carefully into the Buddhist suttas and we watch carefully to see that, uh, how they're being used. And if you, if you have your Majima Nikaya and you go through the individual suttas, once you understand these, the very simplistic uh, sentences that I gave you, there is suffering, there is cause, there is cessation, you're going to see that there's a pattern where he keeps repeating and repeating uh, as he's teaching. So, this was also, we have to first do, what, how did he use them before they became the four noble truths? How were they used by him? 
Actually, they were his path of investigation in his meditation. I'll say it again. The Four Noble Truths were the Buddha's, the Bodhisattva's path for his investigation as he was investigating this whole thing, the suffering and the cause and the cessation. So if we were to look at some of the stories that present themselves in the Majjhima Nikaya, we usually find that somebody comes to the Buddha and there's a problem. And uh, the person has suffering because there's a problem. And they speak to the Buddha or they speak to someone who then takes them to the Buddha to get an answer. And they're discussing the suffering. And then he listens carefully to what they're saying. And when they're finished, he points out to them the cause of the suffering, okay? And he, <clears throat> he, he shows them, this is the suffering that you're suffering. And here, here is the cause of it. And you'll see him describe the cause. And so what would be an example of this? You know, if dependent on the I and um, I and forms, I consciousness arises, and the meeting of the three is I contact. And with I contact as condition, I feeling arises. And if feeling comes up, so the eye sees a form, just like seeing um, this blue bottle, okay? Sees a, the color blue or sees the shape of this bottle, okay? The eye meets with the color and form. Perception says blue bottle. That's what happens there. Perception is naming things in the game. And then eye consciousness gets involved. The three pieces of the, the sense door, the sense door object, okay? and the sense door consciousness have to come together like this and then boom, that's contact. When contact comes, then feeling arises and it's basically pleasant or painful or neutral. Okay, so if this is pleasant and I want to put some lotion on my hands, you know, then the next thing that happens is with feeling as conditioned craving arises. Craving is basically feels, it has a, it has a, the craving is uh, always manifest. It always comes up the same way in everyone. It comes up as a change in tension and tightness in your mind and in your body. And if you were practicing Vipassana where you were sensitive to feelings and are uh, different types of hots and colds and solids and softs and things like this. You're very attuned to feeling the difference. If you look carefully, you will be the person who sees it, sees the craving arise before the other person because you're sensitive to the change that happens inside. This change that's happening is because it's an I like it or an I don't like it mind. Now, with craving as condition, clinging arises. So where craving was basically tanha and the clinging is the upadana. And the upadana is an expansion of the tanha, okay? So if I like it, then what happens is I want it and I want to get attached to it. And the reason I like it is because when I use this lotion, it helps me and that's what, and all this story goes in your mind of, why you like this and why you want it. And you start to get attached to the idea of what's going to come next. And the next thing that comes after Upadana is the Bawa. And the Bawa is where your habitual tendencies for reaction, they live inside your head, like in a little spot, you built a library and it's all the past events that happened to you before and your reactions to all those things. So when something happens in life now and it, it, it occurs, what happens is um, your reaction, the way that you react to it and the birth of action to actually pick up the bottle and take it is based on what you've done before. It sounds crazy, but we don't live in the present as hard as we want to try to. Most of us are experiencing our life about 85% of the time we are reacting 
the same way that we would have to something in the past because it's similar to what's going on now in the present time. So this is this is what's happening for us, okay? So he he's describing to the person, he's listening to the person describe to them. Let's go back to them just a minute. And he tells the person, he tells the Buddha what's wrong. Let me give you a little example. Let me see if you see a good one. Um, 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 Nagalaputta Sutta uh, is a story I think it's the Nagalaputta Sutta is a story of a man who brought his father to see the Buddha after he was ill and his father was very ill and he almost died. So when they came to see the Buddha, uh, the son said, he really needs to talk to you because he's very imbalanced about living and dying and everything. And he says he's so uncomfortable about his end time because he's in his 80s pushing 90s like thing at this time. And he says, I, I need you to help him. So the Buddha talks to him and listens to what the man is saying. And he was saying how when he got sick and he couldn't breathe and he was having a great deal of trouble, he was terrified, absolutely terrified of what this was going to be, what death was going to be. And so he had never really looked at death and come to a balance about death and because this is something that happens for us, and in COVID time, this is a very important thing to understand. Death is part of life. We should say it again. Death and dying is part of life. You're born and you begin here. And when you die, you're going to go down here and you're going to die. And this is a certain line that everybody has in common on the face of the earth. And actually this piece down here is the same part as this piece up here when you're born and you come in. But what happens is we're all welcoming someone coming in, but when it's time for them to leave, we become very attached to them and involved with them personally and everything, and we don't want them to go. But this is a natural thing for them to reach this point where they can, they can pass away. That, that's part number one. Part number two, is basically when I'm teaching death and dying in a death and dying class, you know, uh, when I'm doing that, I usually have you all sit there and say, okay, let's see how it is to die. And they'll look at me crazy like this, you know, and I'll say, okay, come on, let's see how it is to die. So we would sit here and we would just take a breath and then we would let out a breath and take another breath. Let out your breath and take another breath and let out your breath. And you just died. That's it. Now, there are cases where there are accidents. There's cases where people are in great pain. They don't know how to handle pain and there's terrible things that can happen. But for most people, when it comes to the point where you know in, intuitively, this is it, I'm going to die. This is not something to be afraid of. And this is not something that is allowed. And this is not terrifying. This is like the beginning, the end of this line of life, but it's actually part of life, you see? If we go to Majima Nikai number 143, and we look at how Sariputta was teaching um, uh, an Anatta Pindaka how to die. If we look at that real closely, I mean, this is this amazing thing. Just a second, because I have a copy of that here. Hold on a second. Okay, basically when, when Sariputta went up there and uh, to see Anathapindika and he was um, in very bad shape, he needed help because he didn't know how to deal with the pain that he was going through. And he had a lot of fiery 
uh, fever. He had a lot of sharp pains in his belly. He had a lot of problems burning, like burning in his lung and fever. And so they started to train him. And they said, basically, you should train thus. I will not cling to the eye and my consciousness will not be dependent on the eye. I will not cling to the nose and my consciousness will not be dependent on the nose. And they did all the sense doors. I will not cling to the tongue. My consciousness will not be dependent on the tongue. So what does this mean? It means, you know, when you're leaving, your fear is I won't experience seeing anymore. I won't experience hearing or smelling or tasting or touching anymore. And if you are not understanding this more closely, you it's a terrifying feeling that you're going to be leaving and you get this fear. But if you are looking at it and saying, when I leave, I'm not going to hold on to this. It's time for me to go. And this is a person who is terminally ill, a person who um, only has a short time to live or a person who has a severe injury and it's hope and you know the person is going to die. And this person needs the support to be able to leave in a calm and dignified way uh, to die with dignity and peace with a clear mind. So how do you do that? How do you help them to do that? You simply help them to recite this. And the second one, I will not cling to forms. We'll just do the I. And my consciousness will not be dependent on the forms. So I don't have to see. I'm going to let go of feeling like I have to keep seeing and struggling. It's the most peaceful way a person can possibly leave is to practice this and memorize it. And then when it, when it, the time comes, it's just natural for their mind to fall into it. And then I will not cling to eye consciousness. My consciousness will not be dependent on eye consciousness. And then I will not cling to eye contact because my consciousness will not be dependent on eye contact. And then I will not cling to feeling born of eye contact and my consciousness will not be dependent on um, feeling born of eye contact. So you're not, you're letting go, you're relaxing into the final experience of leaving the way that hopefully you, you kind of relax into being born. Sometimes pr pregnancies are rough deliveries, but a lot of times the baby comes out really happy, you know? Um, so then after you do the, the, um, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and the mind also, then you say, I will not cling to the earth element. My consciousness will not be dependent on the earth element. And they go through the earth element, the water element, the fire element, the air element, the space element, and the consciousness element. And they go through that. And this, this is the recitation. And this um, allows the person to stop struggling against the inevitable. Because the one thing we know about people um, dying in total peace and smiling is if they're, they're not struggling when they leave and they have a settlement of understanding. So what is the understanding is the knowledge of how this is working and then, then looking at it. So what they're doing is they're looking at his suffering in this training. They're looking at his suffering and they're realizing the cause of his suffering is fear of dying and and not having a close enough understanding to the connection between dying and life. And so they're trying to take him through the training that he never heard. And someone, someone said to me once, what do you mean? And at the Pentecost was there for all those talks. What do you mean he didn't hear it? Yeah, but he, he was the manager of the people who were setting up for all the talks that the Buddha gave. He was like the roadie at the concert who was the manager for the big concerts that you go and you listen to, but the people came and set it all up before the musicians got there, you see? And, and Anatha Pindika's job was to make sure there was enough food and a place for the Buddha to sit and his monks to sit and everybody was served food and water and whatever they needed they got when all the different events happened in all the stories. 
And he was constantly busy. If you ever go to a concert, you watch that manager. He doesn't have any peace of mind. You know, uh, these wires are not right. They're unsafe over here. You have to fix the microphones. The speakers aren't working. You know, the people are too close to the stage, all that stuff. They have to straighten everything out so that you're safe when you do a concert. And so he was that kind of person. And so he never heard a lot of things that the Buddha taught. In the end of this sutta, it's kind of interesting. Then he turns around and he says to them, why haven't, hasn't this been taught before? And they say it was taught, but mostly it was taught to the monks and it wasn't taught to the, to the lay people in white, which is not totally accurate because we did find places where he was teaching and the people in white were there. Um, but the problem is that um, only a few people got to hear this teaching. And this teaching is what is taught to the monks and nuns about how to die. So this was interesting sutta because I thought Buddha wrote an awful lot about life, but did he write anything about dying? And then I started searching, I found this sutta. After he teaches the elements, you let go of the elements, then he says, I will not cling to material form and my consciousness will not be dependent on material form. I will not cling to feeling. My consciousness will not be dependent on feeling. I will not be not cling to perception or to formations or to consciousness. And then he starts talking about how he won't cling to infinite space. If he's able to still sit in infinite space, he will not cling and hold on to that or hold on to nothingness. And he will not uh, then after or neither perception or non-perception. These are the deeper mental states. So you would not try to hold on there either. And then this is leading to the highest rebirth that he could possibly have. But to leave this way in a sound and calm state of mind, using the Four Noble Truths in order to examine this and understand it completely and let go, let go. And here we also see a, a good pattern when we talk about this. We also see a really good pattern about what the Buddhist teaching was about. And the Buddhist teaching was a steady letting go, letting go, letting go, letting go, letting go, letting go, until there was like nothing and then neither perception or non-perception and then falling into cessation and then coming out of cessation and turning back on and then experiencing Nibbana. So the way to go through that experience, that opening of Nibbana where there's just nothing left. It's nothing, no concepts, no, nothing left in mind. And what does that mean? What could that possibly mean? It's a reboot. It's a rebooting of your computer, rebooting of your brain. It's a teaching you, attempting to teach you to practice letting go of everything that ever happened in the past and um, not be concerned about that, but also of all the worries and pressure of the future of worrying about what might happen next. And when you take away all of this stress and all this stress, it's gone. The only thing that's here is the brain. And the question is, what is the potential of the innovation or creativity or painting or music or almost anything the human being does if they have no pressure anymore on, on the brain from the past side or from the future side of pressure on their mind. And we can't even per perceive of it. And it's, a, it's an incredible feeling to be able to go through and then come out and then look around and see differently, hear differently, smell differently, sharper and taste more clearly. And feel things so much clearer and everything for a period of time after these things happen at different levels. So some people say it's like you rebooted the computer. I like that one. Another uh, class I taught with all women and it basically said it's like letting go of everything and having a newborn brain. And how will you take care of that after it happens is up to you. 
Will you keep and be very gentle with it, understanding what happened and why you're so clear and so full of energy, life energy, and so bright and sharp with your mind? Why? How did that happen? And now can we take care of it? Can we continue to be careful with it and, and take care of it? Well, it's the same, same as having the baby in the hospital. The doctor and the nurse don't come home with you. They don't take care of the baby. It's up to you how healthy the baby is when it goes home. So when you have something like this kind of an experience, you have to be knowledgeable enough to know that you have to be able to take care of it, careful of it, be careful of it, which you introduce into the brain at that point. So it's like, be careful of the new programs you put in. Excuse me. Okay. So then that he, he went through that. And then at the end, it basically, the little sutta ends up in the lesson for Anathapindika. And it comes out I will not cling to what is seen, heard, sensed, cognized, encountered, or sought after or examine by the mind, my consciousness will not be dependent on that. <coughs> mm. Tickle. <coughs> mm. Okay, you know the solution for this, just one second. Let that water get hot and then we'll keep going. Okay. So you're basically, um, as I said, you're backing out and letting go of absolutely everything. So this was like a, a diminuendo part of the symphony and everything was getting less and less and less and less and letting go and letting go and letting go. So you're actually there and you're just simply experiencing this as you would experience anything else. And understanding that, you know, since I'm getting old, I'm usually saying to people, understanding that this, you know, this, this piece, this, this package is getting old and it's like your skin is getting, you know, looser. There's a loose part here in the shell. I remember when my uncle was getting close to passing away, he sadly said to me, you know, I probably won't be here when you get back from Asia. And uh, I'm just getting too old. And he said, I, I sent away to Nassau to get another space suit, but they didn't have one for me. So this is it. My outer shell is getting used up. And we just sat there and smiled at each other, started giggling about it. But that's the reality of it. When a person gets very old, you know, everything is loosening up and there is not the strength that you had before and everything is sans eyes, sans teeth, sans hair, sans everything is it says in Shakespeare, everything is going, 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 going. Your energy disperses, your experiences uh, of the frequencies in, inside of you from consciousness disperse and go into what is probably a universal consciousness that drops into another being at some point and is reborn in another way or you reach an end and you don't come back anymore and that's what the buddha was looking for too personally this whole thing about the four noble truths is what he's doing in his in his lessons he would say to nakalaputa sutta he said to him his father the, remember i told you that he took his father to see the buddha after he was very ill and he said, this was ridiculous. He was so scared when he was ill and he was sure he was going to die. Now I want you to talk to him. 
And basically the Buddha said something pretty simplistic to him. He said, when the body is sick, the mind is still healthy. So stay awake. That's basically what that was about. And it made his father just stop and think that he caught that he was projecting and projecting of what could or maybe might or something like that happen as he was sick. But instead of doing that, he could stay in the present time and he could send loving kindness to his body and comfort to his body and talk to his body and appreciate his body for carrying him through life and be grateful and have a gratitude trip, a gratitude trip in reference to this whole thing. I'm sorry, this is out of control. Just a second, now we have a pot of steaming water. Let me get a cup. This was actually, it was a pretty good relief for his father um, to hear the Buddha say that. And it, it made him stop and look more closely at what being ill is all about and everything. But in many cases in Buddhism today, there's many people who are Buddhist who don't realize what, how much of our life the Buddha was actually touching. In these stories where people come to see the Buddha, they present the suffering. He identifies the cause. He shows them step-by-step step how the cause led to the suffering. Then he demonstrates how to cease, to let go, how the cessation can occur from the suffering. And then he's usually will, if he's not going to teach past, sometimes he will and sometimes he doesn't, he will take the person if he's going to teach path and teach it in a way to show how the path itself and living on the wholesome side of using the path all the time in your life and referring to it. I mean, having it on, on a uh, a stitchery by the wall or in front of you, a list by the door or something so that you can look at it all the time and refer. What is the condition of my view today? How am I looking at things? What is my perspective? Am I taking things too personally or am I taking things um, more naturally, impersonally and looking to see what they are precisely in the present time? This was the the actual perspective of a person in your life. You look at something happening in life in the, in the uh, Eightfold Path, you look at something happening, going on in life, and you say, how do you take that and how does somebody else take that? It's interesting, isn't it? It's like two people looking at an accident happening from different angles and telling someone what happened. You see, it gets very interesting. Okay, so the perspective of the person is very much, uh, very, very important, the right view or the harmonious perspective of how you see things. Do you see them as they actually are or do you project into them something else? And then the second one is imaging what, you know, right thought or right intention, this right thought that goes into an intention, okay? Um, it's a harmonious image in your mind that you hold in your mind or you allow an unwholesome image to go into your mind. And then you then turn that into an intention which flows into an action of some kind, you see? And then the third one is communication. And we say, we hear right speech all the time, but speech is not the only way that you communicate with people especially in business, especially with mothers and children or relatives with each other. If you look at someone a particular way or put your body in a posture in a particular way, it makes a statement. So you speak with a kind of form of communication. And this is this wholesome communication or unwholesome harmonious uh, communication is very important for you in business, in relationships, in families, 
in uh, you know types of uh, things when you're straightening up problems between people, arbitration and things like that. All of this is very, very important. So that's that's your communication. So the next one is action, right action. And right action is not simply the action of the body or the action that you take. But what if we said it was, are you beginning to become aware when you are practicing tranquil wisdom insight meditation, we are teaching you how to notice the movement of mind's attention and how it independently, impersonally moves moment to moment, object to object on its own. <clears throat> and, and learning how to be aware of how that affects everything that you, you follow through with from that point. So that is your communication and movement of mind. And then after the movement of mind, we say livelihood and livelihood is very confined. Don't get involved with a job that has to do with killing or poisoning or slavery with people or causes pain for people. But we take it one step further and say, set yourself up a uh, harmonious lifestyle. Uh, a lifestyle can be in a small hut or a medium house or a palace. I don't care. But wherever you are, have one spot where you can sit in meditation in your living situation and make it so that there's a private time for you to be alone. Even if it's in a corner with a scarf on your head for an hour a day, it can be anything like that. It doesn't have to be a private room in a private prayer room. It can be a very simple thing like a tree on the property where you put a bench or where you go outside and put a bench somewhere around a, a location where you're living. And that's your, your alone spot. And make sure that you have that alone spot to sort things out for your head and sort of balance things. It's a very important part of life. And so that's um, your livelihood uh, and the change to lifestyle, a harmonious lifestyle. Harmony, this is all about harmony or discord. And harmony is what we seek in life. And harmony is what is found in nature. We don't see nature fighting with itself. We actually see it working very well together, interwoven in particular ways in relationship to itself with other parts of nature. And it's, a, it's an attempt of getting a person to settle into a, an impersonal connection with nature that's so important. And then um, we get to the part of right effort. And right effort, we call it a harmonious practice because right effort must never, ever be lost. Again. This is my, my campaign this year, I think. You know, right effort does not mean just work hard, persevere, don't give up and keep going. It's a really serious thing to get your meditation to work. It's not like that. Right effort actually was a practice with four steps in it, four steps of right effort. There were not four efforts. There were four steps in a practice called right effort. And so you can examine the individual steps, but these are not to be separated. Okay, the first step was to recognize the unwholesome mind state in your mind. The second step was to release that unwholesome mind state, let go of your attention off of it, and take your attention off of it and relax your head. The third one was to bring up a wholesome instead of a instead of a uh, unwholesome, replace it with a wholesome, and that was bring up a smile. So you bring up a smile as you return to what you're doing as a task in life, or if you're in meditation, as you return to your object of meditation, okay, you smile. Now the smile is super important because there's a muscle. And we had many talks at this particular retreat. There's a lot of people who say, I don't wanna smile, or I don't feel like smiling. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just don't feel like smiling. I didn't ask you to feel like smiling. And I didn't say um, that you had to want to smile. I said smile. <laughs> and the reason I told you to smile was to activate this little muscle here that runs up here 
It runs up the side here to the corner of your eye and into your head, into your head, and connects in a way where it helps the two parts of your brain up here to separate slightly. And inside your brain, there is a pineal gland. And if you release pressure off the pineal gland, it can then secrete endorphins and dopamine, this sort of thing into to make you feel lighter, and to make you feel happier, to make you feel joy. This is how PT actually works. Anatomically, how PT arises is when you start to go and smiling, and then that gets loosened and that pineal gland can function with the uh, hormones in the proper way. So it's actually an um, operational point for the engines. You can't say, I, I don't want to put oil in the car. <laughs> Good luck if you're on a long trip and you decide you just don't want to put oil in the car and it starts banging and then you have a block that gets locked and you get stuck on your trip and you can't drive the car anymore. You see, so it's an operational thing for the function of the meditation. So this is what right effort is about. And then as you smile, as you come back and you repeat this process, every time you do it, you are training your brain to let go, relax, smile, come back automatically. This is also really hyper important for your practice because this let go, relax, smile, and come back is what needs to happen whenever a distraction comes up in your meditation. Your meditation, it's very important that you don't perpetuate or continue to have distractions, hindrances, disturbances, taints, fetters, and all these things happening that keep you from a clear, simple, clear, meditation where you can watch inside what's happening and how everything is developing with your mind, how it operates, see? Okay, so you don't want that to happen. And so what you do is you keep retraining your mind. And we know in neurocognitive science that if we keep training the brain like this, the same exact way every time, then it's going to start to respond instead of react. If we just let go relax, smile, and come back. We have let go of the tightness of taking things personally. We've let go of it, relaxed, smiled, and come back and started to look in the direction that is where you want to be in your practice or in your task at work or concentration of innovation, development, anything. School, you want to be in the present time. Okay, so that's your practice. And after the practice comes mindfulness. And uh, we say it's basically harmonious observation. Mindfulness is a form of skilled observation. And this skilled observation has a way of remembering things. And what it remembers is it, remem it helps you to remember. It's a built-in system, like a little program. And it helps you to remember what to do if a distraction arises because you've been doing this, you've been letting it go, relax, smile, come back, and it reminds you to do that. It also recalls that when you do do it, you have to do all of the five steps, recognize, release, relax, we smile, return, and, and then repeat is the sixth one, but repeat and repeat the same way every single time. And it's telling you how to purify. It's helping you to purify and retrain your brain, this observation skill. So it, re it recalls what to do when a distraction comes, to remember to do all six of the steps involved, and to repeat it persistently until the brain takes over. And the brain will take over. The students who keep going and actually do follow instructions and go home and continue to do this within about two months, they usually contact me and say, I don't know what happened, but something happened where usually I get really mad and something happened where I just didn't. And I just watched and I let go and relaxed and smiled and came back automatically. I don't know what happened, but what happened was your brain decided that's it. And it did that. It did it on its own. And that's how the brain learns. 
And the last one is concentration. And we changed this to harmonious collectedness because the word concentration in this day and time is harsh. And it usually thinks people think of it as concentrating really hard on something like this. And we want the brain to just let go of that image and we want it to open up like this. And so that inside you can see um, the screen clearly in the dark and also the peripheral vision that goes on the side. We want you to completely release and just watch inside what happens. And so we say a harmonious collectedness of mind. What we're really talking about is productive level of concentration, a level of concentration that is tuned precisely so that the brain will allow you to watch in the meditation and keep watching without disturbance. That's what it actually is, <clears throat> which is in line with the def definition of concentration in the commentary as well. The very first page, it says what we're talking about when we talk about concentration in this whole book, we're talking about a, um, a very collected form of productive concentration, I think is the term that it says on the very first page. Wow, so there you are. Now, your fourth, you've got your four noble truths. You have every time that you are practicing twim, when you recognize the unwholesome mind state, you're seeing the suffering. Mm -hmm. And when you let go and you release and relax, that is treating the cause of the suffering. The cause is taking it personally and tightness in your head. And so that tightness, you want to let go relax and and then smile and come back is the cessation you're practicing all three parts of the noble truths as you're going along and you're using the entire eightfold path to support this so this is how this goes so you had the four noble truths we just showed you how the four noble truths work inside a practice okay and we said that this is the way the Buddha is actually investigating when he goes in. So that was the third one. We said that he's he's using it as his schematic, his path for investigation. Every time he does meditation, he was doing that. And when he's teaching, okay, so it's a teaching. It's a method of teaching is the fourth piece. And he's using it in his suttas. So if you went through the Majjhima Nikai, when I went through and looked at each time somebody was showing up with him, they were always there, always involved. One, two, three, or one, three, four, or one, two, four, like that. The pieces are always there. And I was marking them in my old book. I had really written on a lot. <laughs> and I had it on every page showing you where the first noble truth, second noble truth, third noble truth, or fourth noble truth were happening in the suttas. So he was using them constantly. That's why they're so important. And then the last way that uh, he gives us the Four Noble Truths is basically for a, a practice of arbitration. And the arbitration that happens between two people who are not getting along, or a family of four who are not getting along, or a community issue that's happening where a group needs, is not getting along. You can take the Four Noble Truths and re Re, re, uh, restyle what you're saying just a little bit and say, let's see, what is it that you think the challenge is? And then what do I think the challenge is? And the second thing that's keeping us from making this project work, okay? What is the cause of that, of that, uh, of that challenge coming up? What, is, what do you think the cause of it is? And you take turns uh, writing this down and then you look at what everybody says and then you say, what would be the cessation? What do we have to do to get to the cessation of this challenge so that we can move forward and be productive with what we're doing? And that's the third step and the third noble truth we're using. And each person takes a turn to write this down. And then everyone turns in their papers. We look at the papers together and whoever is the you know coordinator or facilitator tries to uh, suggest a way where we can uh, create a solution to try as a group. And the 
way that this is really fantastic is the person who organizes the solution. They reflect what everybody said the solution should be in their solution. If you do that, you become the king or the emperor, equivalent to the very wise men who solved problems all the time, you see? So these Four Noble Truths were very, very functional things. They were not something that were just the description of uh, what Buddhism was. And if you want to say something to somebody who is asking, what is Buddhism and what did, what did Gautama actually do? A good way is to answer, I think it was um, Kohita maybe answered this way. I can't remember if it was Venerable Kohita or another one, another of the monks, but they said it's to say it is suffering and the cessation of suffering. This is what the Buddha taught, suffering and the cessation of suffering. He discovered basically that if you could see the imperfection, you had to have a base of knowledge in order to be able to see that. But once you had the basic foundation information, which is we can have another discussion on that if you want, where we have a capsule of the minimum amount you must understand in order to practice your, your uh, meditation and be successful because his way of training the meditation was a parallel teaching. The meditation process, the practice of the meditation. And the other one was the knowledge base that you need to understand very clearly. What was the meditation? It was observing the movement of mind's attention in order to see clearly how everything works in life. And what was the mindfulness? It was the observation skill that you used in order to observe that, you see? So these two became totally entwined. Uh, mindfulness is just kind of watching or paying attention to something. If you're not going to do anything with it, doesn't stand alone very well. Okay, meditation, if you just sit and watch and nothing else, no objective, it doesn't work very well. It doesn't solve any problem or change a person's personality and make life a whole lot easier the way he was saying that it should. But if you have the combination correct and you have the, the uh, parallel approach to the teaching, then he, he was grading his own monks on those two aspects. He was telling them, that if you had a um, a plus a painful meditation with no poor comprehension of the Dhamma, that was poor progress. And he was saying, if you have a painful meditation, even with a quick comprehension of the Dhamma, it was poor progress. This was his grading system. It's in the Digha Nikaya. And then he said, if you have a pleasant meditation, and po but poor comprehension of the Dhamma, that was poor progress. But if you want to understand that you're making excellent progress, you have a pleasant meditation and clear comprehension of the Dhamma. So there were these two aspects he was grading his own monks on and telling them that's what you've got to watch out for. The uh, understanding of the Dhamma precisely that meshes with the practice of the meditation. So this is your Four Noble Truths. And this is four ways of using your Four Noble Truths instead of just saying, oh, those Four Noble Truths, yeah. <laughs> So let me open up the floor. Does anybody have any uh, questions about this? Uh, Ma'am Jayashir. Mm -hmm. uh, so the last point which we're just discussing on the progress, first was clear comprehension. And the second one was, uh, can you please repeat that? Oh, the progress line, you want the progress line. Okay, yes. the first progress, the the in his progress for his monks, if the person has painful meditation and slow comprehension of the Dhamma, that's poor progress. If a person has painful meditation, but they have clear comprehension of the Dhamma, 
that is still considered poor progress by the Buddha. Then he says, if you have pleasant meditation, but poor comprehension of the Dhamma, that one is also poor progress, okay? The only one that was excellent progress was when you began to have a pleasant meditation and quick, clear comprehension of the Dhamma combined. You see? Okay? Yes, ma'am. Got yes, it? Ma Thank you. Okay, Got good. It. Thank you so much. Okay. Do you have anybody else have any question on that? Uh, Vandami, sister, uh, Samir here. How are you doing? Vandami, how are you? Okay. Yeah, I'm good. Good, good. good. I'm okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll pull out of it. Yeah, so Bandeji posted us about your health, and we are glad that uh, you know uh, you are all right. So uh, I'll be okay. I just have to get through it. It just has to run its course. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you have the four noble truth which you mentioned. There is suffering. There is a cause of suffering. There is a cessation of suffering. And which is the fourth one? It, all these four ones. And there is a path. Ones. There is a path to the cessation of suffering. There is a path yeah. or a way to the cessation of suffering, and that's your eightfold path. And all these are open-ended. Uh, as you these, are, these are called in English, these are called statements, but they are open-ended statements, statements, meaning they're not closed facts. You understand? Okay. If I were to change the first one, you listen to it. The first one is there is suffering. That okay. means there is suffering in life. Okay. Yes. But if I say to you, all life is suffering, that's a okay. statement of fact. And there's no reason for anybody to go search about it because it's a fact. And so if you were to say that, if that was said to Siddhartha, he would not have gone on a search, okay. you see? But this is where when I questioned some elder monks that were uh, using this when I was in Japan at one point, okay? And I questioned them about how can you be using this they said that's nonsense this all means the same thing when they yes. said that i had to back up and think why did they say that and then i realized they're using english as a second language so as i taught english when i was uh, years ago in taiwan and i taught it in uh, sri lanka as well for a period of time and when you're teaching somebody um, the english language it's not easy for them to understand this is not saying the same thing. You see, this is vastly different than the first set of statements is vastly different from the second statement. In, this, in yeah. the case of the second statement, you're chasing people away from Buddhism. It's simple. You bring a teenage girl in and you tell her all of life is suffering. And you say to this 13 year old girl, um, the cause of suffering is to des is desire, and you don't say anything else to them. And then you say you say to them, um, the way this the the cessation of suffering, there is a cessation of uh, suffering, but the only way to the cessation of suffering is to desire absolutely nothing. That girl gets up and she goes home, and she yeah, goes with her yeah. friends to buy some new that's shoes it. at the that's mall. Why, why should she sit there and listen to you talk that way? And other people Absolutely. who don't know what Buddhism is, other people who do not know what Buddhism is, they look at you and they say, oh, these poor Buddhists, they had such sad, sad lives. This person is dying now in the hospital and they, they're a Buddhist. Oh my gosh, that poor person wasn't happy at all in their life. Never. And I'm there like, what is going on? Why do you think that? Yeah. And they show me what their what their uh, what their orientation booklet says about Buddhists, and it says these are the noble truths. It's a big hospital system in Chicago did this, and they didn't want to take it back because some monk yeah. who had who had English as a second language thought this was saying the same thing as the other sentences, and so you can't yes, yes. You can't blame him. He's mixed up. 
But the Americans, yeah. we certainly do know, we don't want to be sitting there yeah. listening to somebody who says all of life is suffering. That's it. And that's you're going to take your kids to church or take them for Sunday and expect them to go and listen to Dhamma talks? It's not <laughs> going to work. Come on. You have to wake up here. You see? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's Absolutely. what I mean by this whole thing. You see this open-ended um, statement that you had was, uh, there is suffering. And then the, this young man goes, well, what was the suffering? Let me see how did that work? And he spends years figuring out how that works. We have all kinds of documentation about that. And then there is a cessation of suffering. Yeah, okay, I can see that. There are people happy here. There are people happy there and here. But these things are affected by a Nietzsche. But that doesn't mean that you should spend your entire life trying to figure out a Nietzsche. Basically, one walk in the forest will do it. Just one yeah. walk. Yeah, you absolutely. can see a Nietzsche absolutely. all over the place. You see? Absolutely. Yeah, you know, so, so, you are, yeah, you are absolutely correct because of this, it being open-ended, there are quite, uh, you know, wrong notions about the entire, you know, Four Noble Truth. And uh, the, the translation, English translation also is being an image. So, certainly it is. But then you did mention about Siddhartha uh, with a close-ended uh, uh, kind of, you know, one, one liner close-ended, like, how do I define Siddhartha? You just mentioned something about that. So if I if somebody asks what is Siddhartha or who is Gautama, so how do how does one define it in a single? It should be a close-ended, not an open-ended. So what would be the close-ended reply? It should be open-ended, not closed, open-ended, so that you'll search the answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then, then you go into uh, 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 deliberations. If it's open-ended, then you go into deliberations. And that's how, then it gets carried away. So uh, should it be open I don't understand. If you if you say there is suffering, okay, that's an open-ended statement. And yes. so now you go into your text and you look at how Siddhartha figured out what each part was, what each one of the noble truths was. See? And you examine it for yourself and then you read the different suttas and you'll find out. See, one of the things yes. about going to, you know, um, I really have a lot of respect for this study of Pali, but going to one sutta to, to study for a whole entire year, I'm not sure I can agree with that approach because it locks you into one idea. And if you're if you chose a sutta, for instance, to study uh, that involves several parts, um, this is my this is my position, for instance, about Satipatthana and saying that's all you need, just Satipatthana. There's a lot of parts within Satipatthana Sutta that you need to read other suttas in order to really get the whole entire meaning of the parts within Satipatthana that you're saying are the answer to everything. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Get what absolutely. I mean? Yes, if you look yes. and take apart that sutta, you say, well, wait a second. We can't just, it doesn't, doesn't seem to work very well for me to try to play with the idea that that's all you need. It seems very narrow-minded. If that was all you needed, then he didn't need to teach for 84,000 suttas or however many it was. He didn't need to, did he? Yeah. You see? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, I got Yeah, that. so... It's, it's like you have to um, keep an open mind that you're going to search and, and see this the, and discover what it all means the same way that he did. That's what we did for years. Yeah. yeah. And it comes together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Hello? Hi. You. I see you. Hi. Yeah, I'm afraid the camera is not very good today. Um, uh -oh. I, I was very interested in uh, your comments around the um, uh, collectedness for concentration, uh, and that's very clear. Um, and I wanted to just ask you uh, the connection between that and the statement in the Satipatthana around mindfulness. Um, and I'll just, just read it uh, for what I mean. Um, Mindfulness is simply established in him to the extent necessary for bare knowledge and mindfulness. 
And that seems to be- Okay, wait, 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 wait. Whose translation is it? Bikubodi. He says bare knowledge in a sutta that he wrote? Yes, yes, in the Satipatthana. I didn't realize he did that. Bare knowledge, yeah. okay, when I look at bare knowledge and I look at things like access, uh, you know, access concentration, access concentration, for instance, is not supposedly mentioned in the suttas. However, wouldn't you agree that when you learned TWIM, you got to a point where you had access to the first uh, jhana? Oh, yes, yeah. Uh, I, the, way I read, the way I read this about the bare knowledge is, if you like, is the productive level of concentration just enough to give you the knowledge and vision of what you're looking at. I think it, that's good. I think that's a good way to look at it. Bare knowledge, to, just to the point where you need bare knowledge. And that would be a, a holding back from one pointed uh, concentration also yes. to say that I'm going to I'm going to see enough without having to see absolutely everything. We just to see to see what I need to see without getting. Yeah. You know, the whole thing, I want you all to understand that the whole thing that you must be extremely careful with is concentration and the degree of it has to do with the strength of your atta or anatta. There's a control button in there somewhere, okay, that if you are concentrating too hard, there is too much personal craving to get something. You see, if you're concentrating really, really hard on something. And it isn't necessary, and we know that. And the other thing is when we concentrate hard, we see the pressure on the brain if we wire someone up and we can realize that you can notice through the equipment what's happening. Uh, and then what happens when you remove that pressure away and simply witness. So I really, really do like the, I, the, the um, picture in my mind of witnessing you see, I like that a great deal. And some of the gurus use this a lot in India. The witness, you know, when they're saying witness, they mean simply watch. There is nothing to do. The moment we say there is something to do, I need to do something. And I need to disappear in order to reach, you know, to go to cessation and fall, go to the level where I can fall into cessation, have access to falling into cessation. You see, I have to leave the building. <laughs> I was telling someone in the retreat yesterday, they said, well, what does he say? What does Bhante say if somebody is uh, attempting to, uh, you know, still pushing, pushing. He's been known to have a person come in the middle of a retreat and come into uh, an interview. And all he says to them is, you have to get out of the way. But, but, no buts, you have to step aside and allow what's happening here. This is all a very natural, hooked into nature as in that way, a very natural development to be able to observe very deeply and go into the deepest states. What keeps us from going into the deepest states is I do, I stop it. Too much control, you see? And the only time it happens is if you accidentally forget to take control and you fall through, that's one way, or you learn that you need to step aside and allow the development to take place, which is actually an opening, yeah? Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I just wondered whether you, you felt that this this uh, phrase, this bare sufficient just to the extent necessary for bare knowledge was was another supporting statement for um this productive, productive level of concentration. Yeah. I think so. I think so. Yeah. Good. I Thank think you. that's very good. It's a very good point. It's a very good spot to pull it. Yeah. Okay. Thank very you very good. much. Thank you, you. So I'll get Anyone rid of this else? One. Anybody question? <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> Do you all get the idea? Do you see how you can use the use the four noble truths as you're practicing? Do you see it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I let's sign off so I can dive into bed again. <laughs>
the only solution for what's wrong with me is uh, rest, you know, and it's hard for me to rest, <laughs> but we'll do it. Okay. So let's, let's all say our prayer, our closing prayer. I don't have the bells, so somebody has to go ding. Okay. <laughs> At the end. Okay. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.